All right. It is a little after six now, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody to our uh, third edition of the Medication Safety Journal Club. Um, first two editions are also available on the FSHP website uh, under education resources. Um, are also still available on the FSHP YouTube. This is the first of the journal clubs that is available for CE credit. Um, so thank you, Ben, for doing all that extra work to get us some CE for this as well. And a um, little bit about our presenter tonight uh, is Benjamin Harding. He's currently the PGY2 Health Systems Pharmacy Administration and Leadership Resident at Lee Health in Fort Myers, Florida. He received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree at Auburn University in 2020. Uh, previously completed, completed a fellowship at Clinical Pharmacy Associates in Washington, D.C., with an emphasis on HIV, HIV AIDS, minority disparities, and entrepreneurship. After completion of this fellowship, he completed his clinical residency at Pr Princeton Baptist Medical Center in Birmingham, Alabama. In his current role, Ben is able to combine his passion for clinical pharmacy and entrepreneurship to advance pharmacy practice and deliver top-of-the-line patient care. His areas of interest include clinical pharmacy metrics, practice, practice advancement, and the business of pharmacy, including revenue generation and business development. And with that, I turn it over to our presenter. Thank you, Tim, for that introduction. And welcome, everyone, to tonight's CE and our inaugural Med Safety Journal Club, which is open to all FSHP members. Uh, I know Tim and I are super excited to have everyone here today, and so far we have a pretty, pretty solid turnout. Um, so with this Med Safety Journal Club, it's a little different than most CE presentations. Our goal with this is to have a nice, roughly 40-ish minute presentation, talk about new practices around medication safety, and then open the floor up for some discussion about our current practices, what we're seeing at our sites, maybe something you thought was interesting with the presentation. So as we go along today, if there's anything that really sticks out to your mind or anything like that, go ahead and keep a mental note of it. And we'd love to hear your thoughts at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, let's get started on infusion pump best practices. All right, for today's objectives, we're gonna be able to identify types of errors associated with infusion pumps, understand the different components of infusion pumps and the related technology, and apply best practice recommendations in order to optimize the safe and effective use of smart pumps. So before we begin to start about the future and where we're headed with smart pump technology, let's go back in time and talk about how we got to where we are today with the history of IV infusions. So the first recorded infusion occurred in the 1500s between the ailing pope and three donors. They did a blood transfusion. And as you can imagine, they didn't have exactly the modern medical practices that we have today. So unfortunately, it didn't turn out too well for the Pope and his three com comrades. Jumping ahead to the 1600s, we see another milestone in infusion history. We see the first makeshift IV bag that was made out of a pig's bladder and a quill. The physician that was utilizing this technology used it to imbue compounds into dogs and humans to see what would happen. Again, like the Pope and his three donors, many of the, three of the compounds used in these experiments were impure and not up to the highest of medical standards. So unfortunately, there was poor outcomes associated with the dogs and the humans involved. Jumping ahead to the 1830s, we get another milestone. The physicians and the scientists who use infusions uh, had a better understanding of the modern physiology with the human body and were able to identify and mitigate some of the complications involved with infusions, such as air, emb air embolisms. In the 1890s, we see our first successful glucose solution by physicians Bidel and Krauss. And as we go into the 20th century, we see a familiar name pop, the Baxter Travel Company. They were founded in the 1930s and began selling disposable IV products. Now Baxter Travel Company, which you may know better as Baxter International, is one of the largest producers of IV infusion pumps currently in the market. But back in the 1930s, they weren't selling the technology that we see today. Instead, they were selling the glass alternatives of infusion pumps 
infusion bags, or not infusion pumps, excuse me, infusion bags. It wasn't until about 10 years later that the plastic alternatives for bags and catheters were introduced and began to take hold in its place in medical history. Over the next 20 years, there are some technological advances, and in the 1960s, infusion pumps became commercially available. And over the next 40 years, the commercial, the infusion pumps became standard in U.S. healthcare. In the early 2000s, when we saw our next major milestone with the introduction of the smart pumps to the U.S. healthcare. This was a huge milestone in over the next, in the past 20 years, we've seen it take place and become a standard of care in all hospitals. So what will happen over the next 20 years, you may ask? Well, I think with this presentation, we're gonna get a good glimpse and see where the future is for IV infusions. But let's start with the basics. What are infusion pumps? They're medical devices used to deliver fluids into a patient's body in a controlled manner. And there are many types of infusion pumps that exist in healthcare. The most common pump that you're gonna see is a large volume pump. This is the standard pump that you see throughout floors, ICU units, EDs, et cetera. Syringe pumps are used to deliver small volumes of fluids, typically to pediatric and neonatal populations. We have NRL pumps, which are used to deliver uh, nutritional contents directly into the digestive tract. Elastomeric pumps are a type of non-electronic pump that utilizes the kinetic energy in the elastic membrane to provide the force necessary to deliver the fluids in a consistent manner. And finally, we have insulin pumps, a type of ambulatory pump which delivers insulin in diabetic patients. And just a note, these are not all the types of pumps that exist, just a sampling of them. And here are some visual representations of the pumps we just talked about. Going clockwise, we can see the large volume pumps and the syringe pumps, which you typically see in your ICU and pediatric populations. The anaerobic pumps on the far right, and in the bottom left, we can see an example of our last American pump. For those who are working inpatient or even outpatient, you're probably there used to seeing those insulin pumps and used to working with them whenever you see have a diabetic patient come in on them. So what separates a infusion pump from a smart pump? Well, that's going to be the presence of a dose error reduction system, or DERS. This is software that places safeguards on how pumps deliver fluids or drugs to the patient. They use a variety of mechanisms to prevent the overprescribing or underprescribing of medications, and they pr provide a warning to providers when there are potential errors involved. The point of this software is to allow for greater control accuracy and safety of the medications administered and allow for an approved data capture and reporting capabilities. So let's look at the pumps that we just looked at and trying to figure out which one of these are considered smart pumps. So for those who are used to working in the hospital setting, you're probably familiar with the large volume pump and the drug libraries which are associated with them. And drug libraries is one of the components of the DERS technology. So that's gonna go ahead and get a check and say, yes, large volume pumps are smart pumps. And they're similar for syringe pumps. They have smart, they have drug libraries as well as other safeguards present. So these are gonna be considered smart. Now the NRO pumps are a little bit different. Some NRO pumps can have drug libraries associated with it and have other safeguards in place that prevent the over or under utilization of the tube feeds but they're not widespread throughout all manufacturers and products. So we're gonna say that this potentially could be a smart product, but it's just gonna be varying on the unit that you have. And then we have our elastomeric pumps. So as you can imagine, the elastomeric pump being in a non-electronic type of pump is not capable of having any software. So this is not gonna be a smart pump. And then finally, we have our insulin pumps. Insulin pumps are very simil similar to the NRO pumps in that they may or may not have drug libraries and other types of software features that are associated with them. So this would be considered maybe being smart. It just depends on what product you have available. Now, don't get me wrong. These large volume pumps and string pumps work very hard to get their smart status, and I want them to be recognized. So let's just go ahead and give them their degrees, give them a round of applause, we can move on. So looking at the dose error reduction system, there are many components that are involved. 
as you can see listed on the screen. The drug library generally is going to be the large overarching structure that we have in place, and it's going to entail the four other components of which we're going to go through one by one. So let's start with our care areas or profiles. These are methods of grouping infusions based off the location, the unit, or the patient population. And if we look to our left, we can see an example of care areas that we have set up here at the Health. We have our acute care, anesthesia, critical care. We have one for L&D and one for PICU in our NICU. So these groupings, as you can tell, based off the patient population or the location, are then used to group medications that are different, but are maybe used for that particular area. And then we're gonna have our drug entries. These are drug specific and con concentration specific, as you can see on the left. And with them, they'll have their own uh, upper and lower hard and soft limits associated with them, as well as uh, other technical features. So on the left, we can see an example of these drug entries, and you can see how they differ from uh, with concentrations. So you can assign these drug entries to appear in different patient care areas, and we'll use the adenosine pulmonary hypertension at the top as an example. So let's just say, that the 360 per 180 is assigned to appear in the acute care and critical care libraries, and the 90 per 90 is only assigned to acute care. If we have a nurse who is in an ICU setting, they're able to look up the drug libraries for the critical care, and they will only see the 360 per 180 concentration available to select. But on the other side, a patient on your med surge floor, when they look in the acute care profiles, they'll have the option to select for the 360 per 180 and the 90 per 90. Moving right along, another major component is going to be our infusion rate limits, whether they be soft limits or hard limits. And these are limits that are in place to prevent uh, the medication from going too fast or too slowly. So our soft limits are gonna be alerts that acknowledge the user that they exceeded these limits, but they have a warning associated with them that the user is able to override once acknowledged and allow for the user to continue on with the infusion. Hard limits, on the other hand, do not allow this. They will prevent the use from going ahead and starting the infusion regardless of any warnings that appear. So here we can see an example of the soft limits in place. This is one of the drug entries. And in yellow, we can see the upper and the lower soft limit for this drug. So to exemplify this, if a nurse were to start this infusion at nine mLs per hour, they would get a warning letting them know that this is below the recommended amount. As long as the nurse acknowledges that warning, they're able to start the infusion. And for the upper limit, if they started at 501, again, a warning would appear. They could acknowledge it and begin the infusion as normal. But with our hard limits, these are going to prevent the users from moving on at all. So if the nurse starts the infusion at full and four mLs per hour, they will not be able to proceed no matter what warnings they acknowledge. As well as with the upper hard limit, they try to start at one liter per hour, they would not be able to proceed. And our final component of the Dura system is going to be our advisory warnings. These are warnings that appear on the pump prior to starting the infusion, and they can let the end user know about any clinically relevant information, such as that the infusion requires a filter or a central line. So to kind of walk you through when this is going to appear, the nurse will select the patient care area, select the drug entry and the concentration, enter the parameters, and once the parameters are entered, the infusion is, is be going to begin, the warning will appear. Once the nurse acknowledges the warning, they can go ahead and start the medication infusion. So that was quite a bit of knowledge. So let's go with a knowledge check. Which of the following matchup pairs is incorrect? A, a hard limit is an infusion limit that cannot be exceeded. B, a soft limit is an infusion limit that can be exceeded after bypassing a warning. C, a care area profile is an individual who is in charge of maintaining the drug library. 
or D, an advisory warning alerts end users about clinically relevant. So if you said C, you would be correct. A care area, a care area or a profile is a categorization based off the unit, the location, or the patient population. An individual who's in charge of maintaining the drug library is known as a drug library. So all of this technology is fantastic, but the technology, despite how great it is, errors can still exist even when using the DIRS system. For example, the nurses on the floor can select the wrong uh, library and select the wrong drug entries. They can still mix up the infusion lines and allow vasopressin to run this at the rate that a magnesium was supposed to. Because remember, this is gonna be outside of your drug library. Wrong patient errors will exist if they have the wrong patient. Uh, two patients next to the room, the system will do nothing to prevent that from occurring. They can still mix up the dose rate and the infusion rate because the numbers may look very similar and they may not notice the L versus the G in the mix in mLs per hour. And finally, one of the most concerning errors is gonna be custom concentrations or wild cards. And this is when the provider manually inputs the concentration and all the other parameters that are associated with the infusion. But what if I told you that there was a new technology or an up and coming technology that could help eliminate these errors from occurring, specifically the three that are highlighted on the screen. And that technology is known as interoperability. What this is, is a two-way communication between a smart infusion pump and an EHR like Epic or CERN. And what this allows to happen, it allows the provider's orders which are put into the EHR to pre-populate into the pumps and allow for the parameters to cross over. This is known as auto-programming. And as the pump is running, it allows for the pump to transmit data back to the EHR to be documented on the MAR and on flow sheets. And this is known as auto documentation. And the point of all this is to reduce manual entry from the end users, as manual entry is often associated with transcribing errors, and we want to do our best to reduce that from occurring. Now, we, before we proceed, you should be aware that there are a couple of synonymous terms that may appear throughout the presentation for interoperability. It can also be known as bi directional communication, as well as smart pump and EHR integration. So let's visualize the technology in the current healthcare landscape. Going counterclockwise in the top left corner, we have our automated dispensing cabinets like Pixis. In the bottom left, we have our EHR like Epic and Cerner. In the bottom right, we have our barcode medication administration capabilities. And all the way on the top right, all by itself, we have our smart pumps. So the other three are able to communicate rather seamlessly. When a, or, when a provider puts an order into the EHR, that crosses over to the PICS's dispensing cabinets and the nurse is able to pull the medication. They can then take it to the patient's room, scan it, and scan the patient using the barcode technology, and all that is going to be documented back on the EHR. But as of right now, when the smart pumps are started, the information is still contained in the smart pump and cannot talk to the other technologies. But with interoperability, it would change that. And it would allow for the smart pumps to talk with the EHR and talk with the other technologies and gain information from them. But let's say that squares and triangles are not your go-to representation. Let's pretend like we're going to go on a trip to France. So a trip to France is going to be rather expensive for any of those who've traveled to Europe and know the costs associated with the flights and the staying there. So you decide to go to the bank to pull out some money. But you're probably not going to go to the bank. You're going to go to the ATM, which is associated with the bank. You're going to input your information. And while it can give you the money, the ATM doesn't store how much money you have available for your checking and your savings account to be drawn. So the ATM will then communicate with the bank to figure out how much you have available and allow for you to withdraw the correct amount of money. So you take your francs and you fly over to France. But then it's at that point you realize that 
France converted from francs to euros about 20 years ago, and now you need to pull out even more money. But there's a problem, you're in France. How does your French ATM and your French bank communicate with your American bank? Well, believe it or not, but banks actually are one of the first pieces of technology that allow for interoperability. You see, banks across all nations and across the globe are actually able to communicate despite the different governments, the different laws, and the different languages that are speaking. And this is very similar to how uh, the technology in healthcare would operate. The different banks or the different technologies like the smart pumps and the EHR would able to communicate to make sure that the end user is receiving their money or their medication. So all of this sounds fantastic in theory, but has there been any proven benefit to the use of interoperability? And the answer to that is kind of. The technology is still cutting edge, if you will. It has been introduced probably maybe five to 10 years ago, but the adoption has been rather slow. So the, rather, the amount of information available is rather limited. But I was able to find, sorry about that, I was able to find a couple of studies that can show the benefits of interoperability, starting with reduced rates of errors. So the study we're looking at comes from a small health system of about three community hospitals. And they looked at the number of errors that occurred two days prior to implementation of interoperability and one year after the implementation. They included any infusions that utilized a smart pump, but did exclude any OR, L&D and outpatient infusions, as well as any epidurals and PCAs. And what they found was rather astounding. Prior to the implementation of interoperability, they saw 114 errors per 100 infusions, which is a rather shocking number considering that's more than two errors per one infusion. And after they implemented interoperability, they did see a significant decrease down to 96, 96 in errors per 100 infusions. So this is gonna look fantastic at first glance, but there are a couple, there is a caveat associated with this study. The most common error that they found was, the num was labeling errors, which is not necessarily gonna be associated with interoperability. The reduction in labeling errors may have been contributed to the streamlining of workflow processes, not necessarily the communication between the smart pump and the EHR. But there is still some benefit of that it may reduce errors. And if you are becoming very gung-ho about the concept of bi-directional bi communication, and you want to run to your CFO tomorrow with this presentation, you may need to have more than just safety and vibe, but also have some financial data to back it up. And there is some financial data to back it up. The study you see in front of you came from another small health system, which looked at the number of CPT codes submitted prior to the implementation and after the implementation. For those who are unfamiliar, CPT codes are a type of billing code, which is gonna document the procedures that a physician or a provider provides. So for example, it may be they applied a Band-Aid or an ointment, or they provided an infusion. Now, you may think, well, how does this affect infusions? Well, if infusions are not properly documented for being completely infused, you may not get fully reimbursed for that. And with interoperability, it would have a better chance of being fully documented that the entire fusion went through, allowing for better reimbursement. And that is what they found. Prior to implementation, they saw about 120,000 CPT codes, and after implementation, they saw a 15% increase up to 140,000. And they were able to annualize this and receive a rough estimate in the number of revenue generated per year at $1.1 million, which sounds absolutely fantastic, but there's also two caveats associated with this study. Number one, the revenue you see of $1.1 million is really posted revenue. So what this is, means is this is what the healthcare is billing to the insurance. Now, just because we bill insurance $1.1 million does not mean they're going to pay us $1.1 million. In fact, I highly doubt they will. So the number you see is really a estimate 
or a, a false number, if you will, and doesn't truly represent the amount of money that's going to be reimbursed. Secondly, this study took place back in 2017, which doesn't seem too long ago, but in terms of IT technology, that can be rather significant when it comes to the advancements of our smart pumps and our EHR and our ability to document CPT codes. Now, will the advancements provide more or less benefit? That is rather unclear and requires further study, but it's something you should be aware of. But hopefully those two studies did get the ball rolling in your mind that interoperability is coming and it is important. And so as we move forward and you begin to think about this or you see plans for it to formulate, you should be aware of what is required out of the of departments that this is gonna be implemented in. Well, interoperability is gonna require a high barcode medication administration compliance rate. That is because the scan is gonna be rather important when it comes to scanning the medication and scanning the orders and having it cross over from the EHR to the pump. Secondly, orders need to be placed in Epic before they're administered. That's uh, going to be because the order has to translate from Epic over to the pump. If they put it in on the fly or in an emergency situation, the order may not transmit in time for the medication to be administered. And finally, they need to utilize some kind of documentation like flow sheets or the inpatient bar. This will allow for the pump to transmit the data back to the EHR and allow it to store it and document it somewhere there. Now, in terms of project deadlines, EPIC estimates that will take roughly nine months to implement interoperability, but I have seen numbers that would go much, much higher on than that, depending on the size of your health system, the size of your hospitals, and the number of hospitals you have. EPIC does recommend utilizing an all or nothing approach. So what they mean by this is if you're going to implement it, do it in all care areas for a hospital, not just one. This prevents any, mis any errors or any uh, technical trouble, any technical issues that would come from a patient transferring a place with interoperability to one without. And at the very bottom of the screen, I did provide a very, very, very rough estimate of what the cost would look like. Now, I want you to take this number with a very large grain of salt because this is going to be applicable to maybe a small to medium health system, but it may not be applicable for all health systems or even larger health systems. It's just there really for your, uh, I guess, understanding of what the number is going to look like. This isn't going to be a $10,000 project. It's going to be much closer to the seven figures. And then finally, there are some limitations of interoperability. For example, interoperability will not work with blood products. And there are a few reasons because of that. Smart pumps work off medication records in the EHR and blood products do not have an NDC, which is required for a medication record. Secondly, there can be specific blood infusion devices which currently do not support interoperability. Secondly, and I think this is probably the most important thing that I need to stress is that interoperability does not allow for the automatic start, stop, or changing of infusion. And I'm gonna say that again because that's very important. Interoperability does not allow for the automatic start, stop, or change of an infusion. The EHR can send the new data to the pump, but the nurse must manual or the nurse or other provider must manually accept the new orders before the pump will change the rate of the infusion. And finally, all the advisory warnings that appear on the pump will not translate to the EHR. So anything that you have in that pump library needs to be double documented in the EHR. So again, that was a lot of information. So let's go ahead and test our knowledge again. So our question is going to be, interoperability between smart infusion pumps and the electronic health records has been shown to A, reduce the number of medication errors, B, increase the number of medication errors, C, correlate with positive financial performance, and D, correlate with negative financial performance, or E, A, and C. 
And as we saw with those two studies, the, the correct answer is going to be A and C. It has the potential to reduce the number of meta errors and correlates with a positive financial performance. And now we've come to the main event for tonight, the discussion of our 2020 ISMP guidelines for optimizing safe implementation and the safe use of smart infusion pumps. For a brief overview, there are five sections to these guidelines. They are infrastructure, drug library, continuous quality improvement data, clinical workflow, and bi-directional interoperability. If we look to the right of the screen, we can see the number of recommendations that are associated with each section. Now we're not gonna go through every single recommendation for every single section, because that would be rather arduous. But instead, I provide this information because we're going to very much uh, distill all the information in just a couple of slides. So if you see that infrastructure has more slides than clinical workflow, you know because it has three times the amount of recommendations contained in it. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started on our first section, infrastructure. So the first recommendation is to allow for smart pumps to become the standard in all care areas. Generally, we see the use of smart pumps in our acute care, like our med search, critical care ED, but these guidelines recommend that they are present everywhere, including ambulatory and perioperative and procedural areas. They should come provide, they should come with wireless technology and tracking technology, as the wireless capability allows for easy access to reports and reports and data updating of the drug libraries and allows for the support for bi-directional communication. The use of smart pumps should be standard for all infusions, including continuous, epidurals, and PCAs. And they recommend a compliance goal of 95% of all infusions. And this includes both medication and fluid infusions. Managers and administrators should be on the lookout for any barriers that may arise that prevent uh, compliance to this goal, and they should address those barriers appropriately. There should be a defined department and committee with oversight of smart pumps, including the system software, protocol development, the acquisition and maintenance of new pumps, and compliance monitoring. In addition to utilizing reports for compliance monitoring, managers should also perform periodic bedside assistance assessments to, to assess compliance to the DERS and validate that the medications are being used appropriately. There should be appropriate policies and procedures in place that address the transfer of patients between units and external facilities. The short-term borrowing from, of smart pumps from outside facilities to su supplement capabilities, and these borrowed units should be inspected by Biomed, have their data or memory deleted, and be loaded with the institution's own drug library before entering circulation. And finally, for this section, all staff who utilize infusion pumps should be trained appropriately for all pumps that they may encounter, including large volume pumps, syringe pumps, and epidurals. Moving on to our next section of drug library, there should be an established interdisciplinary team that is used to develop and test the drug library. They should meet at least quarterly in order to update the drug library, and they recommend having a log of changes that can be referenced at any time. Prior to any library updates, it will be best to require an independent double check for every entry. Because building of a drug library requires significant amount of manual input, this can also correlate with uh, a high number of trans transcription errors and organizations take any step, any steps to prevent these errors from occurring. And finally, when updates do occur, there should be a standard process for communicating the drug library to the end users, drug library updates to the end users. There should be a standard drug library across all facilities in the health system, including standard drug nomenclature, which re they recommend having tall man lettering included. There should be standardized dosing units, whether it be the dosing unit, such as micrograms per kilogram or milligrams per kilogram, and dosing rate, whether it be per minute or per hour. And the number of concentrations to be standard 
and limited as much as possible. It should be noted that a standard drug library is going to be crucial and critical for implementing interoperability. Any and all safety features should be utilized appropriately, including clinical alerts, care area profiles, and hard and soft upper and lower limits. The guidelines stress that the upper and lower hard limits should specifically be targeted. And the final recommendation for this section is that they should limit the use of volumetric flow rates, such as MLs per hour. For our CQI section, we should have an established baseline and target values for the following metrics that are reviewed on at least a quarterly basis. So on the screen, we can see that we have two sets of metrics, our basic metrics and our advanced metrics. The basic metrics are is what is recommended. And these are metrics that are generally easily obtained by the pump software, such as compliant rates, the number of alerts generated, and the percent of overridden alerts. The guidelines acknowledge that the advanced metrics are going to be a little bit more difficult to obtain as they require more advanced reporting or data manipulation. So these advanced metrics should be considered as stretch goals. And just to illustrate how difficult these metrics may be, let's go ahead and look at the percent of infusions administered with gravity. So as you can imagine, an infusion that's administered via gravity does not utilize a smart pump or any uh, technology or any electronic technology. So in order to determine how many are being administered this way, you must look at the number of infusions that are occurring throughout the health system and subtract from that the total number of pump infusions via DERS or basic infusions. So this does require some manipulation and accessing reports from various uh, technological softwares. Our clinical workflow is divided up into three steps, pre-infusion, during infusion, and post-infusion. For our pre-infusion, they recommend that double checks are required for high-risk medications at shift change, change in rates, and change in bags. And it should be noted that the guidelines do consider barcode and auto-programming as a type of double check, and they do actually prefer this over individual human double checking. During the infusion, you should differentiate, differentiate pumps that are used to deliver medications via different routes. So for example, epidural and IV pumps should be physically separate. And once the infusion has finished, the infusion should be thrown away as soon as possible. And for our final section, bidirectional interoperability, the first recommendation is that uh, healthcare sites implement bidirectional interoperability between the smart pumps and the EHR. And this includes both auto programming and auto documentation. And just to remind everyone, auto programming is when the EHR sends the programming data to the pump, and auto documentation is when the pump sends the data back to the EHR. The team utilized to implement this should be multidisciplinary and should include pharmacy, senior leadership, finance, et cetera. The point is that the representation should include subject matter experts, administrative decision makers, and frontline practitioners who are able to represent the patient care areas where the technology is going to be utilized. There should be established organizational goals for auto programming. Guidelines do recommend that 95% of all infusions utilize auto programming, but they do acknowledge that this is going to be a stretch goal, and they recommend that or they do acknowledge that organizations may need to have lower goals and work their way up as uh, the interoperability becomes more commonplace throughout the healthcare system. And as you can imagine, any technological advancement, there's a number of pre-implementation responsibilities that should occur, such as assessing the wireless infrastructure, implementing strategies that maximize barcode administration, and looking at current workflows to identify any variable workflows and standardize those practices. And finally, there should be the appropriate policies and procedures in place that address the transfer of patients from areas with interoperability to those without and for unexpected wireless network downtime. 
And for our last recommendation for the guidelines, they recommend that there is uh, adequate competence and training for all staff who would utilize smart bombs on interoperability. Now I know that was quite a lot of information. So I did my best to summarize the recommendations that we just talked about for each section. So just to summarize, there should be a defined multidisciplinary oversight of the smart pumps. The drug library should be standardized for the nomenclature. We should have established metrics that utilize and incorporate CQI data. We should utilize barcode administration, double checks for high risk confusions, and a last but not least, we should embrace bi-directional interoperability. And with that, we come to our final knowledge check of the night. The use of volumetric flow rates, such as mLs per hour, is preferred over dose rates, such as milligrams per hour. And this is gonna be false. The guidelines actively discourage the use of volumetric flow rates. So we found this presentation to be interesting and you want to learn more, I would highly recommend the Smart Infusion Pumps by Pamela K. Phillips. This is one of the books that I utilize when developing this presentation. I will note that it is beginning to get a little bit dated at this point, so I would use it mostly for background reading. And finally, for those who are interested in interoperability on the user web for our Epic sites, there is a uh, infusion pump integration and support guide, which I found to be extremely helpful when developing the interoperability part of this uh, presentation. So with that, we come to the end of our presentation. But as this is a journal club, we do want to open up the floor for discussion. So if there's anything that you saw throughout the presentation, if then you know that's going on at your own sites that you would like to talk about, please feel free to unmute yourself and say a couple of words or throw something in the chat. And I added some discussion points on screen in case there's anything you needed to think about. And with that, I will open the floor for comments. Thank you, Ben. Great presentation. Um, and then if I'll, I have the chat open, you know, if anybody wants to put their questions and comments in the chat, um, for those of you who may be shy. Um, and then for those of you who haven't read the full uh, white paper from ISMP, I do recommend it. Um, there's a lot of very interesting nuggets in there. Um, ben was able to touch on a lot of them, but you know, like you said, there's, I think what, about 60 or 70 different recommendations in there. So for those of you who do work on the uh, pumps at your sites, it's uh, highly recommended. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Um, we have interoperability at my site and nursing continuously reports issues with the pump um, communicating with Cerner. We have Cerner at our site, not Epic. Can you elaborate or maybe give some insight on um, if you've had those difficulties with your nursing and with the pumps communicating uh, because wireless connections? Yeah, great question. Um, so at myself, at my site, I'm at Lee Health. We actually have not introduced interoperability to our uh, health system. It's a project that we're currently looking at. Um, so fortunately, I can't offer any input on that. Uh, Tim, I don't know if you could. Um, we haven't yet. I know a lot of the issues, some of the issues that do come up with interoperability is even just with Wi-Fi in your sites and all of the different devices and, you know, even where the pump is located, you know, even when you're trying to update pumps and update the libraries, a lot of times it all is a matter of where the pump is. If it's, you know, too close to the cement walls, um, if it's too far from the, lit, the closest hub. Yeah, we've struggled because our IS team has looked and heat mapped our, our site and said that the wireless connectivity is appropriate. However, our pumps continuously to have issues with association when the nurse tries to scan the pump, scan the patient and scan the drug, and it will not associate. And they believe it's due to the connectivity issue. And we've also had issues when a patient's being transferred and they're using interoperability where it kind of drops the signal. So I didn't know if other sites who have interoperability have had that issue and if they could provide some insight how they resolve that issue.
Hi, this is Nisha. Thank you for that question, Carla. And um, I'm at Cleveland Clinic and we don't have intraoperability at some of our Florida sites, but we do have one within the system that has intraoperability with Meditech. Uh, a lot of time, what I realize is they do put boosters and run checks. We run into issues with the internet connection where the pump is delayed or not picking up signal without intraoperability. Um, and, and, and that's come up before because it's trying to talk to the server and say where it is and transmit data. We've not been really successful with any of those uh, resolutions other than like give it back to clinical engineering, see if there's a battery change, if it's it powered up properly um, and like usage of boosters. So I don't have any good solutions to offer you other than that wireless connectivity. No, I appreciate the input because we are we're really trying to push nursing to use interoperability so we can beat the compliance rate of 95% for the guardrail usage. Uh, but we still come across and we can see where nurses are having issues with the association from that data. Um, so any input or, or is, is much appreciated. Um, it looks like in the chat, Stacy Carson has actually shared her email. Um, I can highly recommend Stacy as a point of contact for these sorts of things. Um, former colleague of mine. Um, so again, she could probably maybe help with some of the particulars. Um, and again, you know, just make sure that, you know, nursing aren't always, nurses aren't always required, like leaning on the interrupt that they also do know how to actually program the pumps without interrupt. And then there was another question, let me pull it up here. Any data on error rates when infusion pump parameters are not standardized? Any issues with incorrect RAS score goal? Can you say the question again? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. All right, sorry. Any data on error rates when infusion pump parameters are not standardized? Any issues with incorrect RAS score goal? Yeah, I didn't see any in in my research, um, but then again, I wasn't necessarily looking for it. I'm not saying it's not out there, but yeah, unfortunately, I also don't have much input for that one either, besides my site-specific information, which I think our parameters usually line up with our EHR and our drug library. Yeah, and I think as far as the RAS score goal, I think, you know, I'd the RAS isn't really being input on the pump side. It's more on your EHR side. Tim, I'm going to chime in. This is Nisha. Uh, I, I was going to say, like, I think it really depends on your local site process. Like whenever you make infusion pump uh, guardrail changes, if that aligns with the orders and order sets you have, and if people can manipulate those orders and if pharmacists are aware on those. I'm not aware of any RAS scores, um, you know, being on the pump settings. I don't know if newer pumps can do that and show it or limit it. Um, so again, I agree with you that, you know, RAS score inconsistencies are typically seen between orders in the EHR and keeping those consistent. Um, and I only know of pharmacist education on verification to check those to make sure they align or clarify those um, but I, I do see error rates sometimes on the pump on infusions if uh, your EHR allows you to manipulate what's built, um, like especially with titration orders, if you don't have buttons or if people can wipe out the standardized admin instructions. And if you're not used to seeing them, then you wouldn't know if somebody has put in something inappropriate and you verified it through and then that is not on the pump. Um, so I've seen certain instances where you hard code the EHR by placing buttons um, and putting it in product admin instructions where they can't change that um, so that it's consistent with the pump limits. Thank you. Um, then we have a comment for tracking documentation for any changes in IT are usually used when making changes to the EHR. But I've seen that many sites don't have necessarily a similar process in place for making changes to the pump library. Um, and then, so do you have a process in place for, you know, making sure you're changing the pump library as you make the EHR changes? 
Can you do that one more time? Sorry, my volume is not fantastic on my end. Yeah, so I think a lot of this is, you know, again, as having um, the person that is in charge of your pumps also kind of in the room as changes are being made to your order builds, your order sets, um, so that the changes in the library can be made, you know, as the HR is being updated. Um, because yeah, that's again issue I've seen at various sites is that the build in the EHR doesn't match what's in the pump, um, and then you have people banging their heads. So this is Kelly Biastri from Baptist in Jacksonville, and we have a really good system. Whereas if they're going to put something into the electronic health record. They always bring the information to me to update the drug library and we coordinate it all the go live and the drug library updates to be on the same day. That, that sounds like a great best practice right there. I know at my site, we have uh, two dedicated uh, drug librarians, and we don't have a formal process for uh, monitoring changes, but we do have our drug librarians present at all of the PNT and other associated meetings, so they are capable of seeing what's coming through and making changes um, on an as needed basis. And I know that they, our two li drug librarians, do communicate rather frequently to make sure that the changes are being included. Um, and talking with IT whenever any other issues that may arise. Yeah, there's really you want all three points to match. You want current literature to match what's going into your EHR, which is going to match what's in your pumps. Uh, this is Carla, and I have another question. <laughs> For those sites who have implemented interoperability, have you seen compliance with the 95% guardrail use? I haven't gotten interoperability in my site, so fortunately I have to defer that question. I think you may be uh, on the cutting edge. That's what it sounds like. I'm not sure about that. We still struggle with just meeting using guardrails. Now we have had a high turnover rate as many facilities have had. So re-educating and just trying to train nursing if interoperability doesn't work, your fallback is guardrails. Um, but we are still struggling in that aspect. So um, still working on that. Yeah, and you know, even that is a lot of assessment too as to, you know, why, you know, is it that stuff things aren't in the library, is it that the library limits are off so that, you know, your pump librarian is kind of one of those things that they're tasked with is making, is checking those things to see why you don't have compliance. Because when you're th thinking about it, just, you know, thousand foot view, it should be a whole lot easier for nurses to basically scan the patient, scan the pump, scan the medicine versus all the steps it takes to actually physically program a pump. And, and this is Nisha, I, I don't know enough about, um, you know, what the barriers are. And it's interesting to note that with interoperability that we look forward to, like solving a lot of these problems, um, you're mentioning that it might not be the solution because people are not using it wisely in the way it's intended to. And I see this with barcode med administration too, like the technology is there in most of our hospitals, but it really just depends on, are we, doing it the right way or is our system designed to give them credit even if they're doing it the wrong way um, and often this is like the scanners you're, you're picking one of the first reasons like hey it's unreadable because it's not syncing or I can't access it because of where um, the computer is located and where the patient is and there's a myriad of pumps 15 pumps and I'm not going to resynchronize all of this because it's going to delay taking care of my patient um, so I'm going to do all what's necessary to take care of the patient now, and then I will scan or document or fix or use a shortcut on the pump to flush the line or use it as a timer. Like 
nurses are very wise. And, and so sometimes I found that in talking to them, the issue is either they don't understand the why, or there's a practical barrier for which nobody has solved something leading to that non-compliance. There's a comment in the chat from David Jaspin um, about using pump compliance in pharmacy and nursing committee and having a process, the process of having pharmacists round with nursing to see what the issues are. Um, and I've seen that um, even for BCMA as your barcode scanning is, you know, have it be a metric that nursing is asked is has to speak to. Um, and then as you find the leaders having to speak to it, they're going to track down the people that are kind of lapsing on it and finding your root cause. And I, I wanted to add to that to say, uh, till I was doing med safety or having to deal with pump libraries, I wasn't really aware of all the settings and things that had to be set up. And sometimes ER pharmacists like are more hands-on and super users and, you know, having an awareness within the pharmacists itself on how your pump library is set or priming the line or setting these things and what our nurses used to, um, it really helps with that peer-to-peer -peer, um, support as things are coming up. So I think it's an opportunity that many pharmacists may not be aware of to say like, how do you hands-on work with the pump? For example, I just saw a new pediatric syringe pump and I was like, well, the labels when pharmacists put them on, you have to put them upside down so that the nurse can use it. Otherwise, they're going to actually pull it out. Or if you put the label around the syringe, it, it's not going to recognize the syringe type and uh, it may not deliver the volume accurately. And had I not gone to that in-service to see it, I really would not have appreciated those two pieces of information. Um, so I think there's more room for a pharmacist to also be aware about some of these pump technologies and opportunities um, so we can drive that compliance. And, you know, having your decentralized pharmacist be your ambassador and having them have, you know, at least remedial knowledge of the pump functions. So then your nurses can come to them and as that resource, you know, and they can then be the gateway to figuring out what the barriers are. Looks like we are a little past seven. Um, the information for the CE credit is in the chat. Um, I believe Tamika will also be emailing it out. So with that, um, I'll stop the recording. Um, and then any last comments or questions?